Chapter 6. Buried Cities of the Amazon. A short time later, I was working intently one evening, when I heard Saint Germain's voice distinctly. Be ready, he said, tonight at 9 o'clock, and I will come for you. I was alert in an instant, hurried through my work, bathed, and was preparing for an early dinner. I will bring you the proper nourishment, he explained, so I waited and entered into the deepest meditation of which I could be aware, recognizing only, God's perfect manifestation. Promptly at 9 o'clock, he appeared in my room, wearing garments of glistening metallic-like substance that looked, as if made of burnished steel, but felt like a combination of very soft silk and rubber, extremely light in weight. I touched the beautiful, wonderful fabric and was so fascinated that, I stepped forth from my physical body, and was unaware of it, until I turned and saw it lying in bed. Stepping forward to a large mirror in the door, I saw, my, garments were exactly like those of Saint Germain. I wondered at this, and did not understand, why they were different from the, ones, in which we had gone forth before. He saw that question in my mind and answered it. Try to realize, my son, that in the, ascended condition of life, we are, always free, to use the pure, universal substance for whatever purpose we choose, and give it any specific quality, we desire, for the requirement at hand. If we wish to use material that is, imperishable, we impose that quality upon the pure, universal substance, and it, responds accordingly. If we wish a form to be manifest only a definite length of time, we give the substance, of which it is composed, that quality or command, and the form manifests accordingly. In the present instance, we are going to pass, through water, and the radiation from the material in your garment so surrounds your finer body, as to insulate you from the natural qualities and activities, of the water element. Try to think upon this power, which is, within, you. Call in to use the great sea of universal substance from which you may draw without limit. It obeys, without exception, the direction of thought, and records any quality imposed upon it, through the activity of the, feeling nature in mankind. Universal substance is, obedient, to your conscious will at, all, times. It is constantly responding to humanity's thought and feeling, whether they realize it or not. There is no instant, at which human beings are not giving, this substance, one quality or another, and it is only through the, knowledge that the individual has conscious control and manipulation of a limitless sea of it, that he begins to understand, the possibilities of his own creative powers, and the, responsibilities, resting upon him in the, use, of his thought and feeling. Mankind, through the centuries has qualified the universal substance with perishability and limitation, and the bodies it uses today are expressing, those characteristics. The entire human race has storms of hate, anger, revenge etc. within its feelings, and the four elements, which have recorded those qualities, return them to man through the world of nature, as storms. The people of Earth have cataclysms of thought and feeling, as resentment against each other, against injustice, against places and things, knowingly and unknowingly sending out the feeling of, revenge. The great sea of universal substance, upon which these qualities have been recorded, and imposed, expresses them back to their source, the individual, by means of the four elements, as cataclysms, in nature. Such activities are but nature's ways of purifying and shaking herself, free, from the contamination of, human, discordant thought and feeling, and returning, to her pristine condition, of God's purity. Every moment, each individual is receiving into his, mind and body, the pure and perfect life of God. Each moment, he is also giving quality of some kind to the pure universal substance of God. This quality, he alone creates and generates, and he must receive it back into, his mind and body, for all things in the universe move in circles, and thus, return unto their, source. The ascended masters, have learned the, law of the circle, the law of the one. Hence, we impose upon the pure universal substance, only, the quality we wish to use, for the special work in hand. If we desire a manifestation to express a certain length of time, we set the time, give the command, and the substance of which that special manifestation is composed, responds accordingly. In the case of the records, at the Royal Teton, and certain retreats throughout the world, it is necessary for our work, that certain things be made imperishable, in order to be maintained during the centuries. We decree, that quality, into them, and they record exactly our decree, for, nature never lies. She is a truthful recorder of the qualities playing upon her.
She obeys us, and also obeys man, but there is a certain activity within her, that mankind is either in ignorance of, or else stubbornly refuses, to acknowledge. For this ignorance and stubbornness, it pays, and pays, and pays, continually, until the individual personal self learns and does acknowledge, this, fundamental eternal truth, it is, the law of the one, the law of love, the law of harmony, the law of the circle, the law of perfection. When humanity really does learn that fact, and obeys, its everlasting decree, the discords of earth and the destructive activities of the four elements, will cease. There is a self-generating and self-purifying force within nature that rises, and throws off all that disagrees with the, law of the one. This force or energy is a pushing activity from within out, and as, the one power, expanding. If discord is imposed upon pure universal substance, the electronic energy becomes temporarily dammed up within it. When such accumulated energy reaches a certain pressure, expansion takes place, shattering the discord and limitation. Thus, the great life of the One, the ever-expanding luminous essence of creation, God in action, overpowers whatever seeks to oppose it, and goes on its appointed way the supreme ruler of the universe. The ascended masters of light know this, and are one with that knowledge. Mankind may know it, and be it one also, if they only will. It is within the capabilities and possibilities of every individual, for it is the innate eternal principle within self-conscious life. All human beings are self-conscious life. This principle plays no favorites, and all can express its fullness if they really so desire. Within the life of every human being is the power by which he can express all that the ascended masters express every moment if he but chooses to do so. All life contains will but only self-conscious life is free to determine upon its own course of expression. Hence, the individual has free choice to express either in the human, limited body or the superhuman, divine body. He is the chooser of his own field of expression. He is the self-determining creator. He has willed and chosen to live as self-conscious life. When one individualizes within the absolute, all-pervading life he chooses of his own free will to become an intensified individual focus of self-conscious intelligence. He is the conscious director of his future activities. Thus, having once made his choice, he is the only one who can fulfill that destiny, which is not inflexible circumstance, but a definitely designed plan of perfection. It is a blueprint, which he elects to express in the realm of form and action. So you see, my son, a human being may at any time determine to rise out of his human qualities or limitations, and if he will give all of his life, his energy, to that determination he will succeed. Those of us who have raised the body accomplish the ascension by giving all unto the God self within, and hence, it expresses through us its perfect qualities, the divine plan of life. Come, let us go. As we started on our journey, I was conscious of going south and east. We passed over Salt Lake City, New Orleans, the Gulf of Mexico, the Bahama Islands, and then came to a silver ribbon which I knew to be a river. This we followed to its mouth. As we proceeded the God voice within me said, it is the Amazon. Now, be conscious, instructed Saint Germain, that the God in you is always directing and master of every situation. Just at that moment, we began to descend, and in an instant touched the surface of the water. It seemed firm, as solid earth, under our feet, and I experienced a feeling of surprise at the contact. He explained further, that we could go under water quite as well as to remain on top, for the garments we wore, radiated a protective aura, for a considerable distance around our bodies, and contained the conditions we needed, which enabled us to explore the subterranean stratas of earth and things, under water. This, he continued, is due to what the scientific world would call, an electrical force field, around our bodies, but the electronic force with which these garments are charged, is of a higher, finer electricity than that known in your physical world. Someday, even your men of science, will stumble upon it and realize, it has always existed in the atmosphere, but they have not known how, to direct and control it, for the service of mankind. It is much more easily directed, by the mind, than by physical apparatus of any kind, yet it can be drawn and controlled through mechanical means. That which the outer world knows as, electricity, is but a crude form of the, great spiritual energy of life. 
It exists throughout creation. As man raises and keeps his consciousness in contact with his inner God self, he will become aware of the gigantic possibilities in the use of this higher power and force. Its service to him is infinite in the creative work that he can do in all phases of activity. We then entered the water, passing through it with no resistance at all. I was slightly startled at the novelty of the experience but remembered instantly the admonition to be conscious only of the God within me, as the master of every condition. Presently, we came near the shore and passed over many crocodiles who saw us but were undisturbed by our presence. Proceeding inland, we came to what looked like the top of a monument. This is the top of a 60-foot obelisk, explained Saint Germain. There is only about 10 feet above ground. It marked the highest point in a city of importance that was buried during the last cataclysm, when Atlantis was submerged. The obelisk is made of imperishable metal and covered with hieroglyphics of that period. Notice, they are very clear and will remain so, because of the indestructibility of the metal. The city was originally built 10 miles from the edge of the river, but at the time it was submerged, the mouth of the river was widened many miles. We raised above the earth, and passed forward, following the Amazon to a point, 56 degrees west longitude. There, we took observations, and then proceeded to a point, 70 degrees west. Saint Germain explained, here was the locality for further observation and research. The section he indicated, covered the Amazon between these two points, and also two of its principal tributaries, the Jurua and Madeira rivers. This civilization, said Saint Germain, was built during the period, between 12 and 14,000 years ago. The portion of the country we are concerned with is that section reaching from where, the Madeira River empties into the Amazon, to a point west, where the Amazon touches Colombia and Peru. 13,000 years ago, the Amazon, was held within great dikes of stone. The entire country around it lay at an altitude of at least 5,000 feet, and instead of the tropical climate it has today, a semi-tropical temperature existed the year round. For a great distance in this locality, the country formed a table land or plateau. Near the mouth of the Amazon were wide beautiful falls. The city, in which the obelisk stood, was built between the falls and the seacoast, about 10 miles south of the river. There were great reptiles and vicious animals to be found in the Orinoco River, to the north. We came to a place near the Madeira River, and Saint Germain continued, this is the site of an ancient city, the capital of the empire and most important place in the civilization of that period. Here, he raised his hand, and it became as clearly visible, as any physical city is today. Notice, he explained, how it was built in a series of circles and the business streets go out from its center, like the spokes from the hub of a wheel. The outer circles were pleasure drives built every third mile. There were seven of these making the city 46 miles in diameter including the central circle. Thus, the business activities did not interfere with the beauty and convenience of the drives. The inmost circle was four miles in diameter, and within it were placed the executive buildings of the whole empire. The streets were all beautifully paved, and constructed 18 inches to 2 feet below the surrounding buildings and grounds. They were flooded every morning, and washed thoroughly clean before the activities of the day began. Observed the unusual magnificence of the pleasure drives, and how gorgeously beautiful were the plants and flowers forming the banks on both sides. One very predominant feature of their architectural design was that on the top floor of almost all the buildings, especially residences, were built adjustable domes. These could be opened or closed at will, as they were constructed in four sections and arranged so as to serve, for either sleeping or entertaining purposes. The days were never uncomfortably warm, and at evening the wonderful cool air from the mountains came as regularly as day appeared. We entered the capital, an enormous structure of great beauty. The interior was finished in cream-colored marble veined in green, and the floor, made of a dark moss green stone resembling jade in its texture, had been laid, so perfectly, as to seem almost like one piece. There were large tables in the rotunda, of the same kind of green stone as the floor, but lighter in shade. These had heavy bronze pedestals placed about three feet from each end. Here, Saint Germain again held out his hand, and we were among living people, moving through the buildings and grounds. I held my breath astonished, for I saw an entire race of golden-haired people, with beautiful pink and white complexions. 
The men stood fully 6 feet 2 to 6 feet 4 inches in height and the women averaged about 5 feet 10. Their eyes were a most beautiful violet blue, very clear and brilliant, expressing great, calm intelligence. We passed through a door at our right, and entered the throne room of the emperor. It was evidently his audience day, for he was receiving foreign and local guests. This was the emperor, Casimir Poseidon, said Saint Germain, in explanation. He was truly God incarnate. Note the kindly nobility of his face and, yet the tremendous power within him. He, was an as, an ascended master, blessed and greatly beloved. For many centuries in myth and fable his memory was kept alive and the perfection of his kingdom described in epic poems, but as time passes into eternity the memory of such great accomplishments fades, and is often forgotten by succeeding generations. Casimir Poseidon was every inch a magnificent ruler. He was fully 6 feet 4 inches in height, well built and straight as an arrow. When he stood, he towered above those around him and, the very atmosphere seemed charged, with mastery. His golden hair was heavy and hung full to the shoulders. The royal robe was made of a material that looked like violet-colored silk velvet trimmed in gold and under it he wore a close-fitting garment of soft golden fabric. His crown was a simple band of gold with, an immense diamond, in the center of the forehead. These people, said Saint Germain, were in direct contact with all parts of the world through marvelous aerial navigation that had been brought forth for their use. All light, heat and power were taken directly, from the atmosphere. Atlantis, during this period, was in a wonderful state of progress, because she had been governed and, shown the way to perfection by various ascended masters, appearing from time to time and, ruling for the spiritual uplift of the people. Again and again all the way down the ages, whenever a great civilization has arisen it has been founded, on spiritual principles in the beginning, and maintained obedience to those laws of life, during the time of its ascendancy. However, the moment any government or the people themselves begin to drift into lax ways, so that injustice and the unclean use of life become habits either of officials or the people, disintegration begins and continues, until they either return, to the fundamental laws of balance and purity, or are wiped out by their own discord, that, the balance may be re-established, and a new start given. Casimir Poseidon was a direct descendant, of the mighty ascended master rulers of Atlantis. In fact, the civilization over which he ruled was, a child of the Atlantean culture and attainment. His capital city was famous throughout the world, for its magnificence and beauty. As the rural districts are shown, watch the method by which objects are transported, for the power these people used was generated in an instrument-like box, two feet square and three feet long, attached to the mechanism of the implement in use. The water supply from the streams was placed under control and its power also utilized. There was no need for police or military organization of any kind because of the method, by which the people were reminded of, the law, and the wonderful sustaining power that was radiated, enabling them to give obedience unto it. To the east in the park, stood a magnificent building. We approached it. Over the entrance were placed the words, God's living temple to man. We entered, and found it much larger within than seemed apparent from the outside. There must have been seating capacity for at least, 10,000 people. In the center of this immense temple, stood a pedestal about 2 feet square and 20 high, made of a self-luminous milk-white substance, that gave off, a white light, with a breath of pink in it. Upon it stood, a crystal globe, 2 feet in diameter made of some kind of, substance, holding a soft self-luminous white light, within. It was very soft, and yet so, intensely luminous, that the entire building was brilliantly lighted. That sphere, remarked Saint Germain, was made of a precipitated material enclosing an intense focus of light. It was drawn, and placed in the temple at that period, by one of the, great cosmic masters, as a sustaining and life-giving activity for the people. It continually sent forth not only the, light, but an energy and power which stabilized their activities in the empire. The sphere of light was focused by the great being and the building erected around it afterward. It was really a precipitated focus and concentrated activity of the supreme God presence. The great cosmic master who established it appeared once a month beside the light and proclaimed the law of God, the law of government and the law of man. Thus, he decreed the divine way of life and was the focus of the Christ activity for the people of that age. 
Here, Saint Germain stretched forth his hand again, and living, talking pictures of this, great being, passed before us. It is absolutely impossible to describe in words the, glory, of that presence. I can only say, he was truly the, son of God, in perfect expression. In a moment, I heard the, great cosmic master, proclaiming, the law, to the people. The record and majesty of his presence, and, decree, are burned into my memory for eternity, so clearly do they remain in my consciousness. I give his decree to you, just as it still stands before me. Beloved children of the one mighty God, knowest thou not the life thou art using is from the, one supreme presence, eternally pure, holy, and perfect. If thou dost ought to mar the beauty and perfection of that, one life, thou cuttest thyself off from the gifts of thy God. Thy life is the, sacred jewel, of thy God's love, the, source, of the secrets of the universe. Thy God dost trust thee with, his own heart's, light. Cherish it, adore it, and let it ever expand unto greater, light, and greater, glory. Thy life is the, pearl of great price. Thou art the, keeper of God's wealth. See thou use it for him only and, no, thou hast received the, light of life, for whose use, thou shalt give an accounting. Life is a continuous circle, the principle upon which thy city is builded. If thou dost create, that, which is like unto thy, source, and knowest his love and peace within thee, if thou dost use thy powers of creation to bless only, then as thou dost move around thy circle of existence, thou wilt know the joy of life, and unto it shall be added greater joy. If thou createst not like thy, source, thine evil shall return unto thee, with more of its kind. Thou alone dost choose thy destiny, and thou alone, answerest to thy God, for the use thou dost make of life, thy being. The great law, no one can escape. Long, have I proclaimed this, law of life. The law of thyself, thou are unto thyself, because thou canst always come unto thy God, if thou desirest the perfection of life. I come not always as now, to hold thy straying feet upon the pathway of truth, nor to remind thee of, thy eternal, light, set upon a mountain top for thy guidance. In a far distant day, I will speak within the heart of man, and if thou dost love life, thou wilt call unto me, abiding in many selves. Let this not confound thee, my children. If thou wouldst know me, the light, thou wilt have to seek me, find me, and having found, abide within me always. In that day, the father, mother, son, will be, one, in the heart of man. The son is forever the door, the way unto God. In thy mind and in thy heart is, my light, ever reminding thee of, my presence, for in the time to come, I will be present only in, that light. Then, will I be wisdom in thy mind to govern the love in thy heart, that thou mayest be filled with the peace of the one life, God. Thy body is but the instrument of thy soul, and into thy soul must stream, my light, or thou wilt perish. My light, in thy mind is, the way, into the heart of all light. Only by my light in thee, canst thou expand, the light in every cell of thy being, into greater and greater being. In thy throat is my light, which is thy power to speak, my words. Through these, I always illumine, protect, and perfect my children. Words that do not this threefold mission, are not my words, and can only bring misery, when spoken. Meditate upon my light in thy mind, in thy heart, and thou shalt see within all things, know all things, and do all things. Then that which is not of me can never confound thee. I speak these words now, and they shall be engraved upon the tablets of earth and the memory of its children. In the far off day of which I speak, one of God's children shall receive these my words, and shall give them forth to bless the world. In that time, when thou hast fully received, my presence, and art letting it always act in thy life and thy world, thou wilt find the cells of the body, thou dost then occupy, becoming bright with, my light, and thou wilt realize thou canst continue on into that eternal body of light, the seamless robe of Christ. Then and then only, wilt thou be free from the wheel of rebirth. Having traveled thy long journey through human experience, and fulfilled the law of cause and effect, thou shalt transcend all conditions governed by, law, and shalt thyself have become, the law, all love, the one. Such is the eternal ascended body of Christ, said Saint Germain turning to me, in which one is able to wield the scepter of dominion, and be free. My son, even now you can ascend into, the light of the one, for, the light, is in your mind, the light, is in your heart, and if you will stand in it firmly, you can and will raise your physical body of limitation into your pure eternal body of light, forever youthful and free, transcending time, place, and space.
Your glorious self stands ever waiting for you. Come into its light and receive eternal peace and rest in action. It needs no preparation. It has all power. Come fully into the embrace of your light self and that moment, even today, your present body can become ascended. As he finished speaking, the pictures ceased. We went a short distance further on and stopped at a place where a large flat stone lay on the ground. As Saint Germain focused his power upon it, the stone raised from the earth and moved aside, disclosing an opening with steps leading downward. We descended about 40 feet and came to a sealed door. He passed his hand quickly over the door, unsealing it and revealing certain hieroglyphics. Center your attention on this writing, he instructed. I did so and saw the words, God's living temple to man, stand out clearly on the door before me. There, in front of me, stood the physical door, we had just seen a short while previously, in the living pictures. The door opened, and we entered a room under one of the small domes built at each corner. In this, were a great number of metal boxes about 2 feet long, 14 inches wide and 6 inches deep. Saint Germain opened one, and I saw they contained sheets of gold, on which the records of that civilization had been written with a stylus. I realized, there must be rooms which had been sealed and preserved, under each of the four small domes, and that the large central dome had been built over the sphere of light. We found a secret passage connecting the four small rooms, passed on to the second of these and saw the containers filled with, jewels belonging to the temple. The third room contained golden and jeweled ornaments, the throne chair, and other chairs of gold. The throne chair was a striking example of the goldsmith's magnificent workmanship. The back formed into a shell making a canopy over the head of the ruler, and from its sides, hung golden drapes made of tiny golden links each forming a figure eight. These were looped back against the chair making a delicate and extremely graceful effect. In the center of the room, was a table about 14 feet long and 4 feet wide made of real jade, resting upon a golden bronze pedestal. Near it, stood 14 jade chairs, whose feet were tipped with gold, the seats curved and, the backs beautifully carved. On top of the back of each chair, as though standing guard, rested a beautiful phoenix made of gold, the eyes set with yellow diamonds. This design symbolized the immortality of the soul, and the, perfected divine being, each individual becomes, as he rises through the fire of suffering, from the ashes of his human creation. The fourth room contained seven different types of power boxes, as I called them, that received and transmitted the force, drawn from the universal, for lighting, heating, and propelling power. The records, showed these people were in contact with, all parts of the world through wonderful airships. Following this civilization came one known as the Pirua, and after that the Incas, both stretching over a period of thousands of years. Shortly before the city, just described was buried, it reached the height of its glory and the great cosmic master, who had drawn the light by which it was developed and sustained, appeared for the last time to that empire. He came to warn of impending disaster, and would have saved its inhabitants, had they heeded him. He foretold the cataclysm that swept the empire into oblivion before five years had passed and announced, it was his last appearance among them. Those, who wished to save themselves, were instructed to leave that part of the country, and were directed where to go with the warning, that the final activity would be sudden and complete. As he finished the prophecy, his body faded rapidly from sight, and to the consternation of the people, the pedestal and the crystal globe holding the eternal light, disappeared with him. For a time the populace were disturbed by the forecast of events affecting their empire, but after a year passed and nothing occurred, the memory of his presence became dulled, and doubt began to creep in as to the fulfillment of his decree. The emperor and those more advanced in spiritual growth left the kingdom and came to a certain place in the western part of the United States, where they remained in safety until the change had taken place. The great mass of the people who remained became more and more skeptical, and after two years one among them more aggressive than the rest attempted to set himself up as emperor. When the real emperor had left the kingdom, he sealed both the palace and the temple in which the light had been maintained. The would-be emperor attempted to force an entrance to the sealed temple and fell, lifeless, at its door. Near the end of the fifth year at noon on the fateful day, the sun was darkened, and an awful terror filled the very atmosphere. At sundown, terrible quakes shook the earth and demolished the buildings into unbelievable chaos. 
The land, which is now South America lost its equilibrium, and rolled to the east, submerging the entire eastern coast 160 feet. It remained so for several years, and then gradually righted itself to within 60 feet of the original position, where it remains today. That activity caused the widening of the Amazon. Previously the river was 18 miles wide, deeper than it is today, and navigable from end to end. It flowed from what is now Lake Titicaca in Peru to the Atlantic Ocean. In a former time, there had been a canal built from the Pacific to Lake Titicaca, and this connecting with the Amazon formed an entire waterway between the two oceans. The name of the continent at that time was Meru, it having been given the name of, a great cosmic master, whose principal focus of activity was at Lake Titicaca. The meaning of the name Amazon, is, boat destroyer, which has come down the centuries from the cataclysmic period, referred to above. The rolling of the entire continent of South America explains many conditions on its western coast, that geologists and men of science have been unable to explain, from the scientific data they have discovered, up to the present time. Thus, do the great cataclysms of nature draw the cosmic veil over civilizations of splendid achievement, and only fragments of these come to light as time passes into eternity. This truth, may be doubted by the outer world, but the records, of that civilization, now reposing in the royal Teton, will one day be its proof, reveal its existence, and the accomplishment, of that former age. As I was shown these tremendous activities, I wondered why a civilization could be brought forth so wonderful, beautiful, and perfect in every way, and then go down, through the terrible destructive activities of a cataclysm. Saint Germain saw the question in my mind and volunteered the following explanation. You see, he said, when a group of mankind is fortunate enough to come under the instruction and radiation of, a great master of light, such as this great cosmic being is, they are given an opportunity of seeing, what the plan of life is for humanity, and the perfection they are intended to bring forth and live in, by their own conscious effort. However, unfortunately, and it has been so many times down the centuries, the people will not try to understand, life, but let themselves drop into a state of lethargy. They do not exert the necessary effort required to accomplish these things, by the power of God, within the individual. They begin to lean, on the one giving the radiation. The sustaining power is only withdrawn, when the individual ceases to make conscious effort to understand, life, and willingly work in harmonious cooperation with it. They rarely realize, most of their blessings are the result of the sustaining power, from the one giving the radiation. If a certain group of souls have been taught the way of mastery, and reminded lifetime after lifetime of their divine birthright, the hour arrives, when no more assistance is permitted. It is then, the radiation of the ascended masters is withdrawn, and those souls are compelled to come face to face with the fact, the sustaining and accomplishing power was not due, to their own effort. These must understand, they can only receive that, for which an effort is made. In such activity, the experiences passed through, compel them to make the necessary self-conscious application, and when that is accomplished, expansion and God-dominion begin to express. There is no failure for anyone, who continues to make self-conscious effort to express dominion of the divine over the human, because failure only comes, when self-conscious effort ceases. All experience, through which the individual passes, exists for one purpose only, and that is to make him, aware of his, source. He, must learn, who he is, recognize himself as a creator and, as such, master of what he creates. Everywhere throughout the universe, whenever the power to create is given to a being, the responsibility of creating is always coexistent with the power. All creation is by self-conscious effort, and if the individual upon whom this, great gift of life, has been bestowed refuses to take his responsibility, and do his duty, his experiences in life will prod him with misery, until he does, for mankind never was created in a condition of limitation and it can have, no rest, until the perfection, with which it was endowed in the beginning, is fully expressed. Perfection, dominion, harmonious use, and control of all substance and force as the way of life, the original divine blueprint for humanity. God within the individual, is, that, perfection and dominion. It is that, presence, within the heart of everyone which is the, source of life, the giver of every good and perfect thing. When the individual looks to and recognizes his, source, as the outpouring of all good, he that moment automatically starts the flow of all good things unto him and his world because, his attention, to his, source, is the, golden key, that opens every good thing unto him. 
the life in every person is God, and only by the self-conscious effort to understand life, and express the fullness of good through himself, can the discord in the outer experience cease. Life, the individual, and the law, are, one, and so it is, unto eternity. Come, he continued, we will go to a buried city near the Jurua River. We traveled west, and soon came to a slight elevation. Saint Germain extended his hand, and again vivified, the etheric records of those people. The place we observed was, the second city of importance in the empire. The one from which we had just come was, the focus of spiritual power and activity, while the second, we were now to see, was the seat of commercial and governmental operations concerned with the physical welfare of the population. Here, was located the national treasury, mint, governmental, experimental, and inventive activities. Not far distant from this city, rose the mighty Andes, the source of the immense mineral wealth of the empire. I noticed one thing among these people that seemed most remarkable. All, were so completely at peace, and thoroughly contented. They expressed quiet and exquisite rhythm as they moved about. The pictures came to an end, and we proceeded to the only rocky spot visible. Saint Germain touched one of the rocks. It moved aside, and we saw a flight of twenty metal steps leading down. These we descended and came to a metal door. We passed through, went down twenty steps more, and found ourselves before a massive sealed bronze door. He reached to the right, and unsealed a square opening, in which were metal stops like those of an organ. He pressed two of these, the great mass slowly opened, and we stood in an immense room, with everything just as it had been in that far-off time. It had been used as a display room for inventions etc., to which the public had access. All the fixtures were made of metal, combined with what looked like opalescent glass. This, said Saint Germain, was made by a fusing process combining certain metals with glass in such a way, as to make the metal, strong as steel and imperishable. One man in the present age came very near the discovery of the same process, for he had all but one element, and that, would have made it imperishable. The entire room was lined with the same peculiar metal and three massive doors led from it. Saint Germain went to a box of stops, pressed three of them, and all the doors opened at once. We entered the first one and found a passage long and narrow, more like a vault than a room. It was lined with containers, filled with discs of gold about the size of a silver dollar, stamped with the head of the emperor and an inscription that read, God's blessing to man. Entering the second door, we found similar containers filled with uncut jewels of all kinds. In the third room, the containers were flat, and held, thin sheets of gold, on which were written, the formulas and secret processes, used in that period, among these, said Saint Germain, are many formulas and processes, which were not used in that former time. They will be given into the use of the present age. He went back to the box of stops and pressed another. A fourth door opened, which I had not noticed before. This led into an arched tunnel or passageway, connecting the treasury with the mint. It must have been at least a quarter of a mile long, and at the far end we entered, an enormous room. It was the main part of the mint, and was filled with a maze of machinery, of most wonderful construction. Among many things I saw were machines used for stamping the gold and cutting and polishing the jewels. They simply fascinated one, so perfect was their operation. Here, Saint Germain showed me a specimen of malleable glass, clear as crystal. In this room were great quantities of native gold nuggets, gold dust, and gold ingots, weighing 8 and 10 pounds each. I was speechless, at such an amazing quantity of wealth in one place, and Saint Germain knowing how I felt, remarked, it is utterly impossible, for such quantities of wealth as you see before you, to be released unto the mass of mankind, because the selfishness within the commercial world at the present time, makes it the height of folly, to let humanity, waste more of nature's gifts. God and nature bestow their wealth lavishly upon the earth, for the use and blessing of the souls who incarnate here but, the selfishness and lust for power, within the feelings of mankind, make them forget the, higher way of life, and cause man's inhumanity to man. The few, who rise to control of the mass should have the intelligence to know that, what helps the mass, helps the individual most, but if they refuse to recognize this, law, self-destruction follows, brought about, by their own selfishness. 
Selfishness and the feeling of power to control others, blind the reason, and dull the perception, of the outer mind to its own dangers, and such individuals, ride headlong to ruin in every case, ruin spiritually, mentally, morally and physically, extending many times, into the third and fourth embodiment following, only when mankind rises out of the mire of its own selfishness and lust, in all its forms, can human beings be entrusted, with all that God and nature hold ready, for right use, but any individual, as he cleanses himself of his own selfishness and lust, may have the fullest use of all these riches, when he will use them harmoniously, and for the blessing of others. Individuals, can, make themselves ready to be custodians of these gifts, for in the age that is already ushered in, only those will have unlimited use of wealth, who have made themselves worthy, to be trusted keepers and dispensers of this treasure. God and nature provide these gifts for man to use rightly and right use alone, is the condition on which they may be received. Saint Germain crossed his hands upon his chest and continued. Mighty God, enter so firmly into the hearts of thy children, that they want, only thee, then none shall want, for any of thy great gifts. He sealed everything as we had found it, and we returned to my body, which I re-entered quickly. He again gave me the crystal cup filled with living substance, and said, My beloved son, you will be a very valuable helper and may God always bless you. With that blessing, he bowed and was gone.